As the New Orleans Saints get ready for training camp, one of the biggest questions surrounding them is will they make one more blockbuster move? And a popular name attached to the New Orleans Saints in those rumors and question marks is wide receiver Devontae Adams. I'm going to tell you why the New Orleans Saints shouldn't make that move for now, but should be open to it as the season begins. We got all of that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? Welcome into another episode of Locked On Saints, your daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Saints. Part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Day. Thanks so much as always. Making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget you can subscribe and follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss the latest episodes. And if you want to keep the conversation going one on one with me, get access to our exclusive film studies, Q&As and more. Head over to joinsubtext.com slash Locked on Saints today. As always, I'm your host, Ross Jackson at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter. Your New Orleans Saints expert, credential member of the media, senior writer and reporter over at Saints News Network, Sports Illustrated's fan nation site covering the New Orleans Saints. And of course, you can also find me every Tuesday on the Locked on NFL podcast and here with you every single Monday through Friday on Locked on Saints. And today's episode of Locked on Saints brought to you by our friends over at LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. So post your job for free today by heading over to LinkedIn.com slash Locked on NFL. That's LinkedIn.com slash Locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. On today's episode of Locked on Saints, will the New Orleans Saints have 2,000 yard pass catchers? And more specifically, could they finally, for the first time in a long time, have 2,000-yard wide receivers. We'll break that down. We're also going to be taking a look at the new and improved, question mark, defensive interior for the New Orleans Saints versus the run. Colin Saunders, Nathan Shepard, Brian Brzee. What did they look like before? What do you hope they look like now? But first, I want to take a look at one of the biggest question marks that's been coming up, and I want to give a lot of credit to my homie Trizzy Trace over at Chat Sports, who also covers the New Orleans Saints, because he's kind of been on the forefront of this conversation, putting it out there, responding to the rumors and things like that. And I've been kind of sitting back, letting it all settle in. But I'm finally ready to talk about why the New Orleans Saints shouldn't trade for Devontae Adams, at least not right now. So that's my big takeaway. Not right now when it comes to New Orleans Saints trading for Devontae Adams. The reason why I say that is because, look, you have a lot that you have to figure out at the top of your wide receiver, or really you have a lot to figure out in your wide receiver core, but you don't have a lot to figure out at the top of your wide receiver core. What you need to worry about right now is getting your big three, Michael Thomas, Chris Olave, Rashid Shahid ready to go out there and be the playmakers that they want to be. No distractions. Don't need to be in a situation to where you're bringing in somebody that's going to fight for that, we'll call it quote unquote wide receiver one, but really the X receiver spot for the New Orleans Saints. You don't want to be in a situation where you have a Michael Thomas that doesn't want to go out there and produce and uh, try to, you know, do all this stuff. If you're the New Orleans Saints and you trade for Devontae Adams right now, yeah, you're, you're bracing yourself in case you lose Michael Thomas, sure. And the the notion of a Michael Thomas and Devontae Adams one, two is very exciting and super fun. Don't get me wrong, but you're effectively telling Michael Thomas right now, we don't trust you. We don't trust that you're going to make it through the season. We don't trust that you're going to be able to go. We don't trust that you're going to be an 80, 90, 100 yard receiver for us. I don't think that that's the way to step on. That's not really starting everything off on the right foot at the beginning of this season. I think it's a little bit too hasty to try to make that move now. Now, there's numbers and figures around it as well, but all of which manageable, just over $6 million for Michael Thomas before the incentives sit in, just over $6 million for Devontae Adams this season. Now, next year, you end up having a little bit more of a a rate that you have to match, but you can handle that. You've got time. You can have a plan for that before you even make the trade. So I don't think there's anything cost prohibitive in making the trade outside of what it will cost in terms of what the trade value is. You have to consider at the Las Vegas Raiders have already invested 42 plus million dollars, a first round pick and a second round pick in this wide receiver. Are they going to be okay with letting him go for peanuts after just one year, despite the price tag that they paid? The answer to that is no, not maybe not, not we'll see, not you should call and find out. The answer is no, they're going to want a haul and they would deserve a haul because Devontae Adams, even at 30 years old, is still one of the NFL's best receivers. He's one of the NFL's best route runners that extends your effectiveness throughout your career 
because you don't have to rely on speed. You don't have to rely on leaping ability, things like that. You're just smarter than the guy and better than the guy that you're lining up against, period. End of, end of question. So Ross, if he's that good, why shouldn't the New Orleans Saints trade for him right now? I maintain. Not right now. But if you get before the trade deadline and Michael Thomas' season is done, I think you make the phone call. I think you make the move. And I think you're willing to pay the premium of doing that because at least then you know you're probably not going to have Michael Thomas going into 2024, but then you'd have Devontae Adams. So that's where I do say yes. I do say yes if you get four games in and Michael Thomas has another season in, season ending injury or something like that, and you want to go out there and get a guy. And let's say that, let's say it's five games and you're four and one and Michael Thomas' season is over. Yeah, you go get Devontae Adams in that case. That's where it makes perfect sense to me because in that case, you haven't paid Michael Thomas $15 million this year. You've paid him $6.25 million, which is, or, or, or thereabouts, which is his base level salary before any of the incentives would kick in. Because the season would be over, none of the incentives would kick in. So if you think about it, what you're really paying somebody is around $12 million. You paid just over $6 million for Michael Thomas. You make the trade, you get Devontae Adams, you pay just over $6 million for Devontae Adams, though that would probably come down a little bit because he's already been paid some of those game checks. So you're probably sitting around paying these guys around $12 million to get your one receiver out there. And at this point, it would be Devontae Adams. That to me makes perfect sense. Logical. Uh, you would be able to figure things out because let's say that the Las Vegas Raiders by that time through five games are one in four. Maybe they are willing to come up off of Devontae Adams at a little bit lesser of a price because they want to see Devontae Adams thrive. They want to put him in a situation where like, hey, we're going to trade you because our season's in the gutter. Their season's on the uprise. Let's get you out of here. Let's get you to a place where you can go out and win. Sometimes that happens in the NFL. Not always. Depends on the owner. Depends on the general manager, stuff like that. Maybe that's a little bit of wishful thinking and I'm okay with that. But even if it did cost you a first and a second round pick, which you don't have, yeah, you do have a second round pick next year. Even if it costs you that, maybe you're a little bit more likely to make that move at that point than you were at the beginning of training camp or something like that. So that's where I do see a trade like this potentially working out and being a good move for the New Orleans Saints. So I wouldn't make it before the season began. I'm putting all my trust in the guys that I'm expecting to be the top three. I'm willing to make a move for a third guy. I'm willing to make a move for a fourth guy. I'm willing to make a move for a slot specialist. I'm willing to make the Hunter Renfro move before the season. But as for the replacing the number one and effectively telling Michael Thomas, hey, we don't trust that you're going to be able to make it through the season. We don't expect you to be back in 2024. So we're trading for Devontae Adams. I don't want to broach that conversation. I want to see the best of Michael Thomas. So I'm going to expect the best of Michael Thomas. That's what you do as an NFL organization. However, if that goes sideways, and the Saints are in a position to where they feel like they are that they are that piece away from continuing to win games and getting to the playoffs, and the Raiders are on the downturn, I'm picking up the phone and I'm calling yesterday in that case. So that's the big caveat for me. Should the New Orleans Saints trade for Devontae Adams right now? No. But should they do it if the circumstances feel right within a few weeks and ahead of the trade deadline? 100% yes. Coming up next, let's get over to the defensive side, to the defensive interior, because the New Orleans Saints had an exodus but then also brought in a lot of folks to replace those spots on that interior defensive line, including a first round pick and former Clemson defensive tackle, Brian Brzee. How will these guys match up against the run specifically where the Saints ranked 24th last year? We got that coming up for you as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints brought to you by our friends over at LinkedIn Jobs. It has never been higher stakes right now when it comes to hiring, especially if you're a small business, because you're looking to make sure that you're going to be able to bring somebody in that fits the culture of your business, that has the requisite experience, and of course, presents you with an opportunity for the upward trajectory. You don't hire people just to fill that role today. You're hiring people for your future. And LinkedIn Jobs helps you be able to call all of that information into one spot so that you're able to make the best hire for your company possible. LinkedIn Jobs is going to help you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. And here's the key for free. You're going to be able to utilize things like screening questions, which are going to allow you to easily focus in on the things that you're looking for within your candidates, make sure that they have the right skills, the right experience, all of that, so that you can quickly prioritize who you want to interview when. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn as the number one site over at LinkedIn Jobs in delivering quality hires versus all the leading candidates. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free today at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. 
All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Thanks again, as always, to all the everydayers out there making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day here on this Monday episode. Don't forget, we're back here with you on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday as well, five days a week. There's no off season here at the Locked on Podcast Network and specifically not here on Locked on Saints. We ain't going nowhere. Uh, Call me Puffy. So don't, 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 don't call me Puffy. Please don't call me Puffy. Uh, all right, so we're taking a look at the defensive interior for the New Orleans Saints. As you all know, uh, when it comes to the New Orleans Saints defensive interior, they had a mass exodus this past offseason. David Onyemata headed over to the Atlanta Falcons. He was one of the starting interior defensive linemen for the New Orleans Saints. Uh, Shai Tuttle was the other guy that was the starter there. He's over with a different Car- with the Carolina Panthers, a different divisional rival. And then you also have Contavia Street, who was brought in on a one-year deal last year but really started to show you what he could do. He was one of my favorite guys to talk to in the locker room. Incredibly smart, smart, knows the game like nobody else. Really, really good dude. He's now over in Philadelphia. The Saints did bring back Malcolm Roach, but outside of that, they had to completely revamp their defensive interior. And they did so by bringing in multiple Super Bowl winning defensive tackle, Colin Saunders, a guy that I absolutely loved in his draft class. I was hoping that the New Orleans Saints would draft. He ended up in Kansas City, had a great time there now. He's here in New Orleans. Nathan Shepard, the very, very hyper-athletic, attacking, penetrating three-tech type that comes from the New York Jets. The New Orleans Saints were actually interested in Nathan Shepard last year, wanted to try to find a way to get him over to New Orleans. He returned to New York for a year. Now he's here in New Orleans. He kind of fits a little bit more of the David Onyemata pass-rushing mold, while Colin Saunders fits a little bit more of the shy Tuttle run-stopping mold. And I'll break down some of those numbers for you here in just a moment. But they didn't stop there. It's not just to proven veterans. Of course, they spent their first uh, round selection on an interior defensive lineman in Clemson's Brian Brzee, a guy that collegiately has kind of not really met the expectations only because he hasn't been able to be out on the field. He's been dealing with family stuff, things like that. All of that's expected to make a turn as he comes here into the NFL. This guy was the number one overall recruit coming out of high school and headed to Clemson. He was actually ranked number one while Bryce Young, who was drafted at 1-1 this year, was the number two guy. Now, things are expected to kind of fall in line for him here in New Orleans. And he gets to work with a guy that just came up from the collegiate ranks as a defensive line coach, where the Saints also made a big change. So it's not just about the changes of the player personnel, but the coaching personnel changed as well in Todd Grantham. The New Orleans Saints were not as good against the run last year as you're used to them being. Top five, top three in most years, especially since 2017 with Ryan Nielsen joining the squad. But last year, they dropped all the way down to 20. So can the New Orleans Saints rank better this year than they ranked last year? And how much higher do they, how much more do they need to improve in order to land themselves as a top tier defense yet again? When we look at all that, you kind of have to move the needle a little bit. You want to be at least a middle of the pack run defense and in a top flight passing defense. So as long as the Saints can match their number two overall passing yards defense last year and land within the top five, That's going to help them keep points off the board, all those other things, something that the Saints did particularly well down the stretch last year in the final eight games where they didn't allow more than 20 points in a single matchup. That hadn't been done since the Dome Patrol was here in town, as I always like to say. So when you look at the individual guys that come in, Colin Saunders, Nathan Shepard, Brian Brzee, can they help you jump those 10, 12 spots as a run defense going into 2023? Let's break it down. So to learn a little bit more about about Colin Saunders to start with, let's understand where he spends most of his time lining up. Last year with the Kansas City Chiefs, he spent 80% of his snaps lining up at nose tackle, meaning that he was nose to nose with the center. So he was lined up directly over the ball. He also spent time, uh, it was around, well, obviously it was 20% in that case, lined up either in the A, on the A gap of either side. The A gap is that gap between center and guard. He was one of the top ranked, uh, he was in the top half of uh, guys, when it comes to pro football focuses, run defense grade, he was ranked uh, 65th, but that's out of 244 rankings. So we have to understand that that's like well above half because half of that would be at 122nd. So he's in the upper half of that half. So he's in the top quarter of NFL players that that graded there. Let's take it a step further, though, and take a look at kind of some of the the, the more advanced metrics. So Colin Saunders displayed 202 uh, run defense uh, snaps in 2023, according to pro football focus. Only had an 8.5 missed tackle percentage, which is solid. Came up with 24 tackles, 19 assisted tackles, and 16 stops. They gave him an 8% stop percentage, which is pretty good. The top of the NFL amongst all players that are on the defensive interior that 
took over 200 snaps was 12.4. So he's not really that far down. In that case, he's hanging around at 27th. He's tied at 27th though. And here's the interesting part. Not only is he tied at 27th, he's tied at 27th with none other than former New Orleans Saints defensive tackle, Shai Tuttle. So, and that was, that was the 2022 uh, ranking. So it kind of goes to what we had discussed before. When we looked at these two editions of Colin Saunders and Nathan Shepard months ago during free agency, the Saints really wanted to be a better pass rushing interior, and they mostly stood pat when it came to their run defense on an individual basis. Let's look at that again from another perspective, and this will be by taking a look at uh, taking a look at Nathan Shepard. So Nathan Shepard's a little bit of a different build, while um, while Colin Saunders is six foot. 320 something pounds is a bigger guy. You've got Nathan Shepard at six foot four, 315 pounds. So he is a big time, uh, you know, uh, he's, he's a very different body type. So he's a lot more of that three tech uh, type. But interestingly enough, when he was playing for the New York Jets last year, he was used 48% of the time lined up nose to nose with the ta- or with the center. So he was lined up as a nose tackle, meaning that he spent 44% of his time or just or it wouldn't have been 44 because he actually spent some time on the edge as well. So you could say he spent 52% uh, either as a defensive tackle, as a three tech lined up in not the A gap, but the B gap. So he was between the, the guard and the tackle uh, or lined up on the edge in a couple of occasions. We're talking 5% of the time, not that much. Uh, he was an interior rusher on 82% of his snaps. So this is what he did. He was a let me go after the quarterback. But in doing so, he was also one of the top interior run defenders in the NFL, landing within the top 40 out of over 150 different players. So you can see, again, he's in the upper echelon of that upper half. So that's good stuff for a guy like Nathan Shepard. Over the 209 pass rushing, or excuse me, um, run defense snaps that he played, he came in with 15 tackles, 15 assists, three tackles for a loss. The interesting thing when you look at Colin Saunders' year is that Colin Saunders didn't have any tackles for a loss last year, which is kind of shocking to consider, but his average depth of tackle was still within three yards. That's important. That means that running backs that were breaking through the line of scrimmage weren't gaining any more than three yards before he was making those stops. Nathan Shepard doesn't fall far far behind that, but he does fall outside of the three-yard metric, 3.2 yards on an average depth of tackle. His stop percentage is 6.4. So it wasn't that much for him. But remember, his goal and his de- his, his sort of deployment all throughout his time with the uh, New York Jets was to rush the passer, not necessarily be a run stopper. So we're not going to worry too much about that stop percentage being low. Finally, we'll take a look at Brian Brzee. Brian Brzee, amongst all ACC um, defensive tackles, comes in with 126 run defense snaps back in 2022. So he wasn't used there a ton, pretty sparingly. He ranks 26th, uh, tied for 26 out of, looks like a total of 38 guys that have spent at least 100 run defense snaps in the ACC in terms of uh, the pass rushing grade. But let's look more specifically at the numbers. The one number that's a little concerning here in run defense, 21.4% missed tackle percentage. But bear in mind that that was only three missed tackles. So it was three missed tackles, but it wasn't, you know, you didn't have a ton of snaps to really go off of there. So that percentage becomes a little bit more swollen. But one of the things that you love about him is that in the run game, with his 7.4% stop percentage, which is right around, you know, pretty good. It's uh, top, almost top 10. Oh, sorry. No, he had a, I flipped it. He had a 4.7, not 7.4. My apologies. So he was 26th there. Not great. Uh, but his average depth of tackle was just 1.6 yards upfield. That's a key metric. That's a key stat. Because again, he wasn't playing a ton of these. He only had nine tackles uh, out of the 126 uh, run defense snaps that he had. But when he made those tackles, you weren't gaining much yardage when he was involved. So he might not have the tackles for a loss in the in the run game that you would you know that you might see from some of the other guys like Jay, like the Jalen Carters of the world and all that. But he definitely comes in and is making plays in a more than reasonable and considerable depth of making sure that you're not breaking big runs when you're running his way. That's very, very valuable. When it comes to tackles for a loss in 2022 for Brian Brzee, he did have five and a half. So he got there, he got into the backfield. So he had more than Colin Saunders. He had more than 
uh, Nathan Shepard at a different level of the game. So hopefully he's able to bring some of that in with him. But the, the main thing you're looking with at the New Orleans Saints improving when it comes to their interior defensive line is their pass rush. So with the run game, they might stay middle of the pack around the NFL, maybe even 20th at this rate. But if you've got guys like Carl, like, uh, Carl Granison, who was the top graded run defender for the New Orleans Saints, Cam Jordan, second highest top graded run defender for the New Orleans Saints, you get some of that continued um, assistance from your second level, from your slot corners, all that kind of stuff. That all will help. But I do think that the Saints may not have made the improvements, at least on paper and run defense on the defensive interior that you would have hoped for. But hopefully that's where coaching becomes the difference. Going to Todd Grantham, having you know Dennis Allen a little bit more involved there, Ryan Nielsen on his way out. He's, of course, with the Atlanta Falcons now as their DC. It's got to be the coaching that helps them get there. It's got to be the schemes, all these other things. So we'll see. We'll see. But for right now, when it comes to just looking on an individual player to player basis, it doesn't look like they move the needle very much on the interior defensive line when it comes to their run defense. Hopefully, the coaching will be all the difference. Where they did move the needle this offseason, though, is I think their passing game by improving their quarterback, by improving their tight end position, by improving their running back position in the pass catching realm as well. But they've also got three fantastic wide receivers that hopefully will all stay healthy. If they do, could they finally have two 1,000 yard receivers? We're going to break that down as we continue on and wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints. Put a Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints brought to you by Bird Dogs, my absolute favorite when it comes to some of that athleisure wear and much, much better than some of those other brands like Lululemon and all that. You're getting the exact same stuff as that. I think better, honestly, but they fit way better, uh, much cheaper, all of that. So you can go ahead and find it all over at Bird Dogs, whether you're looking for the khaki shorts that are like the stretch khakis that look like khakis but don't feel like khakis uh, if you're looking for maybe the the running shorts and things like that with the liner on the inside maybe you're looking for some joggers as well they have it all over for you at birddogs.com slash locked on nfl i have uh three pairs of bird dog shorts and a pair of joggers i love them i want to wear them all the time i never want to take them off so if you want to check them out today Head over to birddogs.com slash locked on NFL. Enter the promo code as well, locked on NFL, and you're going to get a free Yeti style tumbler that's custom made with the Bird Dogs logo. So you can rep your Bird Dogs in a whole bunch of different ways. That's birddogs.com slash locked on NFL or promo code locked on NFL to get that free Yeti style tumbler. And just like me, you won't want to take your Bird Dogs off. I promise you that. Let's get it, Houdat Nation. Wrapping up today's episode of Locked on Saints. It's Monday, so third segment is always the same. We're looking at our bold predictions. I've done bold predictions already for uh, Alante Taylor with the uh, the pick six in the first two games. Um, I looked at Jamal Williams as the 1,500 yards from scrimmage guy. Now, I'm taking a look at the wide receivers over the offensive side, and I think that the New Orleans Saints could have two 1,000-yard receivers if all goes to plan here in the 2023 season. Obviously, health is such a big factor here, but I will say this. If things kind of happen in a certain way, I could see this with two different pairings, maybe even a third, and one of those doesn't even include a wide receiver. So here's what I'm thinking. The last time that the New Orleans Saints had two 1,000-yard receivers, they got 1,173 yards from... Brandon Cooks, they got 1,137 yards, interestingly enough, from Michael Thomas. It was back in the 2016 season. The thing about that and to consider is that in that season, Drew Brees threw for 673 passing attempts. The most that Derek Carr has ever thrown in a single season is 626, but that was only two years ago, one season away from last year in 2022, or excuse me, 2021, and that was kind of the final John Gruden-ish year. Remember that whole everything happened. He got, you know, he kind of left in disgrace. And then you have Richard Bas Rich Basaccia who took over after all that. So it was like a whole thing. But that year is not too far removed when it comes to Derek Carr. In that season, he threw just over 20 touchdowns, but he threw 14 interceptions. In that 2016 season where the Saints had two 1,000-yard receivers, Drew Brees threw 15 interceptions, uh, but also threw a 5.5 touchdown percentage, which came into 37 touchdowns. So you could see a little bit there of where like 
how the Saints were able to do all of that. And the volume was absolutely there. They had a horrific defense that year as well. Uh, Their defense that season finished, let's see, 31st in points, 27th in yards. So this is where the big difference is. And this is what I mean by things kind of have to go the Saints way. The defense has to be able to get off the field for the right reason here in 2023. They have to keep opponent drive short. They have to, you know, the special teams has to come through, pin them back and, you know, force long drives, things like that. So that they'll be able to take advantage of that and then keep the offense on the field here in 2023. I had an interesting question not too long ago, just to give one of our, our subtexters a shout out, a shout out that came through and asked about whether or not the New Orleans Saints were going to be more focused on staying on the field a bit more and stuff like that and, and, and trying to put together longer drives. And really a big reason why the Saints weren't able to put together those longer drives is because of the fact that, well, they couldn't convert third downs. They had trouble staying on the field on the offensive side of the football, the defensive side did a wonderful job, specifically the last eight games of the season. You think back to that Carolina Panthers game in week 18, the Saints offense should have been churning that entire game. But what happened? Chris Olave is running routes on the left side of the field and Andy Dalton's throwing to the, to the right side of the field. Like it, there were all these weird things that were going on. Now you inarguably, like without argument, have a much better quarterback in Derek Carr than, uh, than of Andy Dalton. And you potentially have Michael Thomas and Chris Olave for 17 games. Here's the caveat. If the two of them play 17 games, no, forget that. If the two of them play 15 games, they'll probably, they could get 2,000 yard receivers here if they're throwing at the volume that I expect they're going to be throwing in 2023, which could be 600 passing attempts for Derek Carr. If that is all the case, then yeah, the Saints should have 2,000 yard receivers next year. If Michael Thomas gets injured halfway through the season, then no, right? That, that is the type of thing to where, He'll have so much volume in the first half of the season that if he gets injured and then ends up being out for the rest of the year at that point, it's going to be tough for another receiver to step in and be able to pick up over the course of just half the season and get to the thousand yards. Not impossible, especially with a guy that gets targeted downfield so much and as effectively as Rashid Shaheed. But if Michael Thomas ends up with an injury within the first three weeks and then the Saints go to Rashid Shaheed immediately and get him as the flanker, use... um you know, uh, Chris Olave as your ex receiver, then all of a sudden, yeah, it's early enough in the season that I could see uh, Rashid Shahid end up picking up. And of course, I'll acknowledge what we talked about at the very beginning. If that happened, and then the Saints were to make a move on Devontae Adams before the trade deadline, then I could see Chris Olave and Devontae Adams being the thousand yard receivers. Here's the other one that could be a lot of fun. And this one would probably require an early season injury, not require, but like this one would probably be in the case of an early season injury for Michael Thomas that, that ends his season. What about Chris Olave and Juwan Johnson? Juwan Johnson had a spectacular year last year. And if he becomes a little bit more of a go-to guy because of injuries, if he becomes a little bit more of a go-to guy because Derek Carr loves his tight ends, he'll have Foster Moreau there to take some attention as well. This is a guy that racked up 508 passing yards as well, excuse me, receiving yards as well as seven receiving touchdowns and really didn't start to pick it up with Andy Dalton until the middle of the season. So if he starts off in that place, like we've seen during mini camps and OTAs with Derek Carr, and the Saints have to turn to their tight ends in the passing game because of injuries at wide receiver, what about him and Chris Olave potentially both being 1,000-yard receivers? Now, that's probably more likely to be a 1,000-yard receiver in Chris Olave and then maybe a 700, 800-yard receiver in Juwan Johnson. But it is an interesting thing to consider that if things were to go a certain way, that maybe you finally get another 1,000-yard pass catcher at tight end for the first time since Jimmy Graham. So those are the ways that I look at it. I think that the Saints can do it. If I want to do the bold prediction part of it, then I'll say that the 2,000-yard receivers going into 2023 would be Michael Thomas and Chris Olave. Because Michael Thomas has only played in 10 games in the last three seasons. There's not a lot of expectations around him. Most people only talk about Michael Thomas right now in a means of making fun or saying like, yeah, well, you know, he'll be injured and done before the season starts, or he'll be injured during training camp or something like that. I'm not looking at Michael Thomas that way. I'm looking at Michael Thomas and saying, Michael Thomas wants to be out there on the field. He's got this incentive heavy contract. He wants nothing more but to prove the other people that are saying that wrong. And it's on him to do that. And I think that that's enough charge. It's enough drive. We talk about Derek Carr having a chip on his shoulder. Michael Thomas is going to have a chip on his shoulder as well. And Chris Olave is one of the best young wide receivers in the NFL. So Michael Thomas, a healthy Michael Thomas with a chip on his shoulder and a healthy Chris Olave, I think both of those guys get you a thousand yards. And there's a chance that that happens here in 2023, especially if the Saints offense does what they've effectively been telling us they want to do, 
which is air the ball out and attack uh, in with with the passing game. If they're able to do that, then yeah, I think the Saints could end up with 2,000 yard receivers for the first time since 2016. All right, y'all. Coming up in tomorrow's episode, we're taking a look at some of the other big questions around the New Orleans Saints, but this time I want to get focused in on the safeties. Um, we're seeing a lot of these top 10 list coming out right now, edge defender or really edge rusher is what they looked at, linebacker and safety. Who are some of the guys that belong on the top 10 list that are on the New Orleans Saints across the NFL? And how important is that safety position specifically when it comes to Tyron Matthew and Marcus May? We're going to break all that down in tomorrow's episode of Locked on Saints. And I appreciate you as always for making us a part of your day, part of your routine for saying yes to me and the show. As always, if you see me, say hi. And if you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints in between these episodes, make sure you follow me on Twitter and whatever other social media platform you're using at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're mom and them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.